now we're opening our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. This morning we begin a new series. And this new series is going to take us through the first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke with a theme titled, Good News of Great Joy. That is the theme of Christmas. If you look at the Gospels through Matthew, through Mark, through Luke, well, Mark gives us now a uh, narrative of Jesus at 30 years old. But in Matthew and in Luke, you see that the th constant theme of the Christmas story is good news and great joy. And how many of us know that during this time in our world, we need good news and we need great joy? You turn on the news, it's all bad news, it's sad news, some is fake news, but this is good news. And the good news, it's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what brings us joy. That's what gospel means. Gospel means good news. And the good news brings peace. It brings joy to the heavy heart, to the troubled heart, to the heart that, that needs peace. And we're approaching the, this season of Advent that some would call it. The word Advent means His coming. We're approaching the season of Advent knowing that we as Christians live in between two Advents. The advent of his first coming and the advent of his second coming. Because just as he came once, notice he's also coming again. Remember that as you look at the word advent, his coming, when he came. Jesus came, he was born, he lived his earthly ministry, he died on the cross for our sins, he was buried and resurrected. And notice this, after he ascended, he promised us that he would come again. Now, Luke chapter 1 starts with the annunciation of John the Baptist. This was the announcement of the forerunner. And today we're going to talk about the future of the forerunner announced. The future of the forerunner announced. In fact, you could title that in your notes, the future of the forerunner, because this is how this gospel begins, with the future of the forerunner, and it ends with the ascension of Jesus. It begins with the forerunner, and it ends with the Savior. And that's what the Gospel of Luke is all about. In fact, I want to give you an introduction to the Gospel of Luke here, because as I was studying the first two chapters, and I was excited, and the Lord gave me a series for Christmas for all of us to go through five weeks in Luke and studying the birth of Christ and the narrative. And as I was studying, the Lord made it very clear that we're not going to start at, stop at chapter 2, but we're going to go through the entire Gospel of Luke on Sunday mornings now. So know that. Someone's excited over there on that side. <laughs> but that we're going to learn about the nature and character of Jesus. In fact, this Gospel is called the Gospel of Praise and the Gospel of Prayer. There's no other gospel between the four accounts that we have in the New Testament that mentions more about praise and about prayer than the gospel of Luke. It's called the most beautiful book in the world, some would call it, the gospel of Luke. Why? Because Luke wrote with the skill of a historian, the care of a physician, the songs of a musician, and the insight of a theologian. He brings in clarity, detail into the humanity, nature, character, life, ministry about Jesus. There is no other gospel that gives us more of a fuller portrait of who Jesus is than the gospel of Luke. Did you know that? We learn more about Christ through the gospel of Luke in detail than any other gospel in the Bible. In fact, what is the purpose as to why Luke wrote this book? Write this verse as a key verse as we look at the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. This is all about the good news. This is all about great joy. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus himself says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Why did Jesus come? He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And we were all lost without Jesus Christ. But he came to seek us. He came to save us because we could not save ourselves. So as we look at the miracles, the teachings, the parables, and most importantly, the humanity of Jesus Christ, we receive the fullest portrait of who he is. 
This here, coupled with the sinless perfection of Jesus Christ, teaches us that because he is the only perfect person born of a woman, notice chapter one and two, as we'll read it, and that he identifies compassionately in his humanity with those that are suffering and sinful people, then he alone is the only one, notice, that can qualify to carry our sorrows, forgive our sins, and give us the gift of eternal life only through Jesus Christ. This is why Luke is writing this book. He mentions Christ as the one that has all the authority to sit at the right hand of the throne of the Father, the one who gives us the Spirit to those who believe. And today we know that many of us need the Holy Spirit in our lives. He emphasizes the grace of God to all people, not just to a certain group of people, but notice what Luke does. No matter what race, ethnicity, background, history, past you may have, the grace of God is for you. You may think, well, I'm too far out. God doesn't love me. He can't forgive me. I'm lost. Well, Luke here reminds us that God's grace is for you. The compassionate Son of man. Would you write that down? The compassionate Son of man. He came to live among sinners. He came to show us that He loves us, that He cares for us, that He wants to meet our needs. God came near, Emmanuel, and the greatest picture of God coming near is through His Son, Jesus Christ. In John 1 14, notice what the Apostle John also says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is the only begotten of the Father? Jesus Christ. So Luke points us to Jesus, his ministry, his love, his compassion, his grace, his forgiveness for you. And he does it in such a way where we understand him the best. And I want to invite you this morning that you would stand on your feet as we read just a few verses. Here in Luke chapter 1, we'll read through verse 14. I'll read the odd verses. you read the even verses out loud together. Luke 1.1. 1, 1. And as much as many have taken hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, It seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. They were in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. According to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. But the angel said to him, Do not fear, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Lord, we thank you for this gospel that you have given to us, the good news, great joy to all people, not just to some people. Thank you that you have loved us to meet us right where we are in sending your son. We pray that you would teach us through this text that we have read, that we would learn and glean and be ministered to this morning. In Jesus' name, together we would say, Amen. amen. You may be seated. One of the things that we remember, it's important that we think about as we look at Luke chapter one, is that God is reminding us that God answers prayers and always keeps his promises. 
When you think about the future of the forerunner, remember this, God answers prayers and he always keeps his promises. When you think of Luke chapter one, the annunciation of John the Baptist, remember this, God answers prayers and he always keeps his promises. And this begins here giving us now the time and the day in where Jesus was born in the days of King Herod the Great. But we begin here by seeing in chapter one of Luke, verse one, where Luke says in his introduction, in as much as many have taken hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. He's writing this gospel. And this here begins in verse one with Luke's declaration. Notice Luke's declaration. He says this, as many have given an account or have set out to write their own narrative of what took place or the things and events that were fulfilled among us. Now, the reason why he says fulfilled among us, because these are Old Testament messianic prophecies about Jesus. They were prophesied in the Old Testament. They were fulfilled in the New Testament. And these were fulfilled, these were accomplished, these were completed among us. These are known already. These are believed already in the Christian community. And he says, as much as many that have written their own accounts of all the prophecies that have already been fulfilled that we have seen and that we know about, notice what he says there also in verse two, just as those who were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, deliver them to us. Just as those that were with him from the beginning and there were eyewitnesses, and that were ministers of the word or there were servants of the word of God, they delivered these accounts to us. Just as those not only that wrote them, but also those that were eyewitnesses and those that transmitted these accurate or authoritative accounts to us of the gospels regarding the life of Jesus. And he's referring back to those that maybe with an, an oral or verbal now account, a narrative, they were speaking to others about Christ or the original disciples that had from one place to the other given now their testimony of what took place in the events of Jesus. Or maybe the biographies that had been written already, well, they had been delivered to us. Now that was his declaration. Notice the determination that now comes here in verse three. It seemed good to me also having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. Now notice there in verse three, what does it begin with? Luke says, it seemed good to me. After I had a perfect understanding, after I had investigated carefully everything from the very first, Now there the words from the very first also mean from above. After I investigated carefully everything and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the discernment that comes from God, after having spoken to the apostles and those that were with Jesus from the very start, even Mary and other women that ministered to Christ, Luke diligently interviews them. He researches the ministry and the life of Christ. And he says, it seemed good that after having done all those things, I write to you an orderly account. Now, do you notice what's the difference between this account and the other accounts of the life of Christ in the gospels? This one was done in chronological order. This is why he says an orderly account. I want you to know how the events took place in sequence. I want to give you an accurate account. Almost honorable Theophilus. You know the word Theophilus, that name means lover of God. And it's believed that Theophilus was a Roman governor or dignitary because of how Luke addresses him. He says, oh, most honorable, or now you who are in position, or you who are in rank. It's important that I would write to you an accurate account of the things that you have already heard. Why is it important to have an accurate account? So that we know the truth from those of other accounts that are not in scripture that maybe were exaggerated or not told the way that actually happened. Have you ever played that game telephone as a kid, right? 
And you begin with one thing, right? And at the end, after it's gone through 10 other people, it's an entirely different message. Well, he says, I want you to know that you have the accurate message. And this is Luke who's speaking here. Luke, a companion of Paul. If you read through the New Testament, you notice that Luke was accompanying Paul to his different missionary journeys. In fact, Luke was a physician. He was a doctor in Colossians 4.14. You see that Paul mentions him. He says, Luke, the beloved physician. He, he was a doctor. So as a doctor, as a man of research, he applied himself to interview eyewitnesses, other accounts, other biographies, and come up with a, the most accurate, precise, chronological account of the life of Jesus Christ. Now, why does he do all of this diligent work? Verse 4 tells us here that you may know. Circle the word know. Why is this important? So that you know. There are many people that don't know about the life of Christ, that don't know the love of Jesus Christ, that don't know that he died for our sins, that, that don't know the reliable facts, the accurate accounts that took place in Jesus. So he says, I want you to know for certain with reliability, that everything that you were taught happened with clarity. I, I wanna give you that clarity. I, I wanna give you the assurance that the things that you were instructed are true. In fact, he says this, that you would know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. You see, Theophilus was already a man that had heard the faith. He, he was already a believer It is thought through history, but Theophilus, lover of God, now needed to be established in the faith. And he says, this is what you must know. You, you must have the assurance. You, you must know the certainty that, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is worthy of all praise, of everyone's worship, because he's the son of the living God. Do you see here what Luke is doing? He's saying, you must know this. You have the greatest message that you have been given. Notice what our attitude should be. You have to know this. And you have to be taught this the right way. And you must receive an accurate account in detail of the life of Christ. So through chapters one and two, after this introduction, you see how the good news or the announcement of the Messiah being born came to different people and how these people responded to the message. Only Luke's gospel opens this way. How did the announcement come to different people and how they responded to the message? Why is this key for us today? Because the announcement's coming to you. Now it's up to you how you respond to the message of Jesus as well. And notice what happens there in verse five. This is now giving us an introduction of a faithful priest, the father of the forerunner of the Messiah. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, his wife, was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. This is Luke's dedication. Now notice, you, you saw his declaration. You saw his determination. Here comes the declaration of that account. And it happened on a specific time, on the days of Herod the Great. Now I want you to know why he mentions this, because this was a time of great hostility for the Jewish people. They were living under the oppression of the Roman government. And this was a time where they were hopeless, a very dark time. There was no prophetic word from God for 400 years since the time of Malachi. For 400 years, no one had heard revelation or prophetic word from God. So the spiritual leaders of this time, during the time of Herod the Great, they were in bondage to tradition. So in some instances, they were given to corruption and others were waiting for the coming of the Messiah because of the oppression that they lived in during the days of Herod the Great. Now, Herod the Great, if you study history, you know that he was known for his building projects that he built. He was known for his authority, his power, but even more so for his paranoid attitude and character. He was so cruel of anyone that would want to come and threaten his power that he even killed his own sons and wives. 
And the day that he would have died, he knew that no one would cry on the day of his death. So he called his officers that when he would die, that they would go and slaughter families of many people in the land so that they would be weeping and mourning when he died. Now think about the type of king he was, the tyrant he was. Why is it important that we mention this? Because no matter how dark the day is, God always has devoted, obedient people. And that is us. No matter how dark the day is right now, God always reserves a remnant, a witness to be the light of the world. And even during this day, there was a certain priest named Zacharias. During a dark day, there was a faithful priest. During a dark day, there was a faithful marriage, a faithful couple. What was the name of Zacharias, the meaning of his name? It means Jehovah has remembered. Would you write that down? Jehovah has remembered. And he was of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron. They both came from priestly families. And her name was Elizabeth. Her name means God's promise. God's promise. So Zechariah's name means Jehovah has remembered. Her name means God's promise. Notice what happens here during this time in this marriage. Those two names together means God has remembered his promises. How many of us are so thankful that God remembers his promises? Through Zacharias and through Elizabeth, you know God has remembered his promises. What did God remember? That he would send his Messiah for his people. God has remembered his promise that a savior is coming, reminding us that no matter, again, how dark the world gets, God always has that witness, the salt of the world, the light of the world, the salt of the earth, a city that is set on a hill that should not be hidden. Zacharias and Elizabeth were that salt and that light during that dark time, reminding us that God always remembers his promises. Now notice what happens, how God uses them, because we look here at their character in verse six. This is the type of marriage that we want to be. This is the type of faithful servants that we want to be, not only in marriage, but also serving the Lord. Because it would say there in verse six, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. What were they? They were both godly people. They were both devoted people. They were both righteous. What does that mean? They were right before God. They were right in the eyes of God, both of them. If there was ever a compliment or a pursue, a goal that you would have for your marriage is that you would both be right before God. Is your marriage right before God? Is that relationship that you have, is it right before God? Are you living blameless before God in holiness? Because you can't be right before God in your marriage if you're not right with one another. I heard a quote this week regarding D.L. Moody. He said, I don't want to hear anything about Christianity coming from the life of a man who doesn't know how to treat his wife. They were both righteous. They were right before God. They, they were walking, notice, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of God. Not only were they right, but they were walking. Well, you would say, well, I'm right with God. How does your walk look? Because their walk looked like they were both obedient to God. They were both obedient to his regulations. They were carefully obeying God's commandments. And he uses this word blameless. The word blameless speaks of a life that's peaceable, a life that's quiet, a life that's obedient. It refers to the motives in the inside of a person who wants to be right. They had right motives. They were without blame. They were seeking to obey God. They were pursuing God and they were pursuing God's will. Now, this is amazing for us to look at in verse six, because in spite of the godlessness around them, think about this. In spite of all the godlessness around them, they were faithfully serving the Lord as a blameless couple. They didn't say, well, notice what, how Herod is or the oppression that we live in. They, they didn't make that excuse. 
And, and not only were they serving in difficult circumstances, but verse 7 tells us that they, they had a problem. They had a need. They had something that grieved them. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well in advance in years. She was unable to conceive. This was grave disappointment during the time of ancient Israel. Some people believed and assumed that it was God that was judging a woman or a marriage when they would not be able to have kids. But not only did they not have ch children, they also weren't able to have any because they were well advanced in years. And he gives us a specific timeline. Luke does it. I love that he does this because he's reminding us this is all a part of God's plan. They may, be ha they may have been disappointed because they didn't have kids, because it was known as a reproach. They may have had sorrow or grief, but how many of us know that our disappointments are God's divine appointments? These are God's divine appointments. God has a perfect time. You may think it's too late. We're well advanced in years. We're past the time of giving birth, but God has a specific time. And these two that were suffering this reproach, they were still righteous before God, faithfully obeying God and serving him. Do you see that the grace of God doesn't exempt anyone from trouble? You wouldn't say that, you know what, today I've received God's grace. I shouldn't be suffering. No, the grace of God doesn't exempt anyone from trouble. Elizabeth, Zechariah, they both love the Lord. They didn't abandon their faith even through these circumstances and even through this sorrow. They stayed serving the Lord. They were trusting in God. They had faith in God. You know what faith oftentimes is described as? Faith is believing in the dark. I can't see what's happening, but I trust in God. The Bible says the just shall live by what? Faith. Elizabeth, Zacharias, righteous, blameless, faithful, obeying, serving, in difficult circumstances, and in sorrow, they didn't abandon their faith. What an example of number one, a faithful priest. Write that down, a faithful priest. But not only was he a faithful priest, in verse 8, we see that he was also a fearful priest as well when the announcement came. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God. Now I love this. And I would tell you to underline and highlight that part. <laughs> while he was doing what? Serving. A lot of people say, well, I want to hear God speak to me. Well, be busy about him and serve him. I want the Lord to do that new work in my life. Well, then be busy and serve him. Here comes the word of God to them by, by an angel, this unplanned interruption, but it comes while he was serving in the temple. There was about 18,000 priests, it, it is believed, during this time, and once week twice a year one week twice a year they would the group of priests that they belonged to would go and serve in the temple and this happened while he was serving while his the turn of the group that he belonged to of priests came up and while he was serving is important because when we get busy for god then god will direct us sometimes we think well you know what i'm not going to do nothing for god but i want him to open every door and use my life I want him to take me to that next place. Well, what are you doing for him right now? Are you busy serving him? Are you busy doing anything for God? Because when you're busy for God, you should know he will direct you. He will direct your life. That's what happened to Moses. That's what happened to Gideon when he was threshing the wheat. Moses was out tending the sheep. Peter was faithfully a fisherman, and God called them while they were faithfully serving that's when the Lord called them. And notice in verse 9, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell, or they would use this system almost as of throwing dice, trusting in God, that within that group of priests that were selected one week, twice a year, one priest out of that group would be called to go into the most holy place to burn incense and pray for the nation of Israel. Now this priest, as he would go in, he would, they would tie a rope around his waist and give him a bell so they would be able to hear him walking around that most holy place. And if they didn't hear that bell ringing anymore, it's because he stopped walking because God struck him dead, that he went in sinful or with 
out confessing sin in his life into a holy place. You notice what they did with that robe? They just dragged him out. We're so grateful that the Lord doesn't strike us anymore like that. He is so filled with grace. All of us, you know, during worship, we were just falling one and the other. <laughs> but God is full of grace. And once a year, or, or one week out of the year here, as they would come in as priests, Zacharias was selected to be that one that would go into the most holy place. And this is when the supernatural invaded the natural. This is the great moment here because God's sovereign plan for his life and his family began. It says that in verse 10, the whole multitude of people were praying outside the hour of incense. The hour of incense came. He went into the most holy place, Zacharias, to pray for the sins of the people. And the hour of incense came, so the multitude was outside waiting for him to come out. And as they were waiting for him to come out from the very presence of God, known as incense, it describes prayer in Scripture. What were they doing? They were also praying outside. It's so important that when the hour of prayer comes, you know what the people should do? Gather to do one thing. To do what? To pray. The hour of incense, the hour of prayer came. And you notice what the people did? They came to pray. They came to wait on God. They came to hear from God, the whole multitude of people. Uh, the encouragement for us even today, tonight, Sunday, the hour of prayer at 6 p.m. as we come to pray that the multitude of God's church would come and do one thing, pray as well, seek the presence of God. And this is what happens here in verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Think about what happened. He was there serving, and, and, and there next to the altar, it would tell us that an angel of the Lord appeared, standing on the right side of the altar, and he was afraid. The word there says that he was troubled. He was shaken. He was overwhelmed. In fact, think about this. He, he saw an angel. First of all, he wasn't warned about this. I mean, just think about his, his mind, the thoughts that are going through his head. He probably thought, does this happen to everyone that comes in here? <laughs> the rest of the guys didn't tell me this. Or he's recognizing the holiness of the angel and his own sinfulness, so he's afraid. And notice what the angel tells him, do not be afraid. That is a constant also theme, repeated phrase through the story of the birth of Christ. Don't be afraid today. You don't have to be afraid. Why? Because your prayer has been heard. God answers prayers and he always remembers his promises. Remember that. God answers prayers and he always remembers his promises. He said, don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Why should we not fear? Because God hears our prayers. What prayer was it that God heard? It was the prayer of the redemption of Israel that he prayed in that holy place. God, would you redeem Israel? He was praying that prayer for them. As he prayed that prayer, he says, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayer today. You don't have to be afraid. God has heard your prayer as well. This is coming from his word. And notice the promise that comes there. It says, Zacharias, your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Your prayer is heard for the redemption of the nation of Israel. But God would give the redemption of Israel. He would announce the coming of the Messiah by giving you a son, through your wife Elizabeth, and you shall call his name John. Now, John here is a beautiful name because it means God has shown grace. God remembers his promises and he shows grace. Isn't that amazing? This family will receive the message. And this is a commandment from the Lord. He says, you're going to name him John, that God has remembered or God has shown grace. God answers prayers. God keeps his promises. Hope is on the way. And this 1,500-year reign of the law was about to be replaced by the age of grace now. God is now showing grace. 
God is going to show us grace through his son, Jesus Christ, and your son would usher in the Messiah. Think about it. These are the two greatest desires that Zacharias as a priest had. The first desire was that, of course, the nation of Israel would be redeemed. That's what he was praying for, for the people. But he also had this sorrow within his heart that he had no child, him and his wife. And now the angel is telling him that he would use his miracle baby that I'm about to give you as a part of sending the Messiah that would be the announcer of the coming King, Jesus Christ. He's giving him here the announcement. Now they probably had already given up on this prayer. He, he's probably wondering, well, are, are you speaking of the prayer for Israel? Or are you speaking of the prayer for my son? Because it had been a long time. In fact, the word tells us that they were already advanced in years. But God is answering his prayer in his own time. How many of us know today that God answers prayers in his own time, not ours? Sometimes we've been praying for a long time. We pray for the salvation of a spouse. We pray for a job. We pray for breakthrough, for calling, for ministry. We pray for a special person to come into our lives. And for a while, it's a heartfelt prayer. And we give up at a discursion because it's not happening year after year and you thought it would happen and you said this was your year and it didn't happen again. Zacharias and Elizabeth probably prayed for a long time to have a son and they probably maybe even had given up a long time on this prayer. That they stopped believing that God would actually answer this. But know this, remember this, God's delays are not God's denials. The Bible says, Jesus tells us even through Luke 18, Men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Don't give up on that prayer that you've been praying for, for that person, for that son, for the husband, for the wife, for the job, for the spiritual breakthrough. Men always ought to pray and never lose heart, never give up. In verse 14, it tells us this, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. This is the character that is gonna be given about the forerunner's birth. You will have joy and gladness. The, the hallmark theme of Christmas, joy and gladness. Why? Because God answers prayers and he keeps his promises. Why can you have joy and gladness? Because God answers prayers and he keeps his promises. In verse 14, and many also will rejoice at his birth. Why will they rejoice at the birth? Because John the Baptist would usher in the announcement of the salvation for all people. So he would bring great joy for everyone in the message that he would bring. He would usher in joy. He would usher in gladness during time of oppression with this announcement of the Messiah. And it tells us this regarding the character of John. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now you can stop there. He's going to bring joy and gladness. Because God is faithful, because God remembers and keeps his promises and answers prayers. But also here it says that he would be great in the sight of the Lord. This is, this is the only place where it matters whether or not we're great. In whose eyes? In the eyes of the Lord. This is what true greatness is. True greatness is not being great before man. You know what true greatness is? Being great before God. <laughs> Sometimes we care too much about the opinions of what other people say about us. But what does God have to say about us? Because here it would say that John would be great in the eyes of the Lord. John would be the one that would fulfill God's plan for his life as a unique role and prophet, forerunner for Jesus. Not only that, Jesus himself would say that there's no one greater of all the prophets than John the Baptist. And it says his life would be separated and consecrated as it would describe there in verse 15. And he shall never, nor, neither drink wine or strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. What was going to happen? God's hand was going to be upon him. He would be separated. He would not be drinking alcohol or now touch wine. He would be separated for God's special use all the days of his life. And he also would be filled with the Holy Spirit. This has to do with his character, but also his empowerment. God's hand would be upon him. God would direct him in obedience towards his will for his life. 
And, and notice the ministry, the character, the empowerment, but also the ministry of John in verse 16. It says, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. What was his ministry to do? He was there to point people to Jesus. The future of the foreigner was to point people away from himself and towards Jesus. You know, that's your ministry as well. To point people away from yourself and towards Jesus. That we would say, we want to decrease so that he would increase. That we would say, we want to make it all about Jesus and not about ourselves. He would turn many of the children of the nation of Israel and reconcile them back to God as they respond and repent in this message of Jesus Christ. I like to hear this word that it says, to turn many. This is a word that's a biblical term for conversion. You were going one way, you turned. And now you're going a separate way. There's a, there's a change in your life. You made a U-turn now. You, you were going one direction and you turned around. Now you're going towards God. You turned away from sin. You turned away from death. Now you turn to life in Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul tells the church of Thessalonica, he uses the words, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. How you turned to God. What is John's ministry? To lead many people to turn to God. That we would turn to God. What did he say? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You know what he said? Behold, look at the Lamb of God. Look at Jesus. There is the perfect sacrifice. That's the Lamb of God. When many believed that they had a Lamb that would take away their own sins and the sins of their family, well, John says, that's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins. It's the substitute for our sins, takes away the sins of the world so that we would have forgiveness. And this is what he was saying here, that the, the angel Gabriel in verse 14, he would prepare Israel for the Messiah. He would point people to Jesus. And he would also say in verse 17, he would also go before him. Notice, he would be the forerunner in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. Again, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. What was this, the mission of his ministry? To prepare people for the coming of Jesus. He will go before him in the, in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Elijah was a man who called Israel to radical repentance. You know what the same parallel ministry that Elijah and John the Baptist had? The message of repentance. A lot of people want to preach the gospel today, but they never talk about repentance. I'll tell you this, the, the gospel without repentance is not the gospel. You know what the gospel tells us? The good news of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins, but that we also need to repent from our sins, turn from our ways, and follow Jesus Christ. That's why he comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah with the same anointing, with the same power that Elijah came calling people to repent. He'll turn the hearts. Notice what he says, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He'll turn the hearts of those that are disobedient so that they would listen to the wisdom of the just to make a people prepared for the Lord. This is Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled regarding John as well. That God would use a prophet to turn the hearts of his people back to himself. They would have an initial fulfillment when regarding the prophet Elijah, when John the Baptist came, but also a later fulfillment that one like Elijah, an Elijah-like prophet would come in the end times. The Bible says that one like Elijah would come to warn the world of judgment. That's the very thing that Elijah did, John the Baptist did, and the prophet during the old end times. The Bible says there'll be two witnesses. You know what they're gonna warn the world of? Judgment. The forerunner, John the Baptist, was warning people of judgment so that they would turn to God and repent of their sins. And you see here that he was fearful as he's receiving this message, but then he's also faithless. And Zechariah said to the angel, how? Has God ever spoken to you so clearly? And you said, oh, really? How is that going to happen, Lord? Sometimes we say, well, Zechariah, how could you ask that question? An angel is standing right in front of you. What's more believable than that? 
And he was doubting and unbelief. He said, I'm old. I'm well advanced in years. Notice the excuses. He looks at his circumstance instead of looking at God's promise. I want to tell you, maybe God's speaking to you, and instead of you believing and trusting what he's saying, instead of looking at his promise, you know you're looking at your circumstance. Stop looking at your circumstance. Look at his promise. How is this going to happen? He wanted a sign. Would you prove it to me? He didn't want to maybe be disappointed by setting these high expectations that would not be fulfilled or met. When God wants to do a work in your life, trust him. Don't ask him for a sign always. Lord, just give me another sign, would you? God doesn't need to give you an explanation, and you don't need to give him an excuse. When God gives you a word, just wait an expectation. Lord, if this is what you want to do, Lord, I trust you because I know he who is promising is faithful. You are faithful, and you answer prayers, and you keep your promises. Now notice there in verse 18, as that continues, my wife is well advanced in the year. He's saying, I'm old. And, and listen, let's be honest. My wife is old too, he's saying. <laughs> and the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, who, sent, who was sent to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings. What was the problem with Zacharias here? He, he looked at his circumstance first and at what God can do last. You know what we need to do? Look at what God can do first. Look at your circumstance last. If you really trust that he is who he said he is, we are not to put our eyes on what is logical, but we're to put our eyes on what God is asking us to do. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the world? Are you going to believe the circumstance? Are you going to trust in what's logical? A lot of us like to be very logical with things, right? This doesn't make sense. You know what? Usually when God does things, it doesn't make any sense. When it doesn't make sense, usually that's when God is in it. And that is God right there showing up. Now notice the, the angel's response. I'm Gabriel. Hey, Gabriel means strong man of God. I stand in the presence of God. I, I was sent to speak to you to bring you this good news. You know, you know what? Gabriel also reminds us as a messenger very quickly that we also are given the opportunity to preach the gospel and bring good news to other people people that are hurting, people that are lost, people that need hope. Not only would you have a son, but your son is a significant role in God's plan of redemption, John the Baptist. And here's the sign. You want a sign then? All right, here's the sign. Verse 19 and 20. But behold, you will be mute. You won't be able to speak. And you won't be able to speak until the day of these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. When are God's promise is fulfilled in your time or his time? In his time. Therefore, you'll, you'll be mute. You won't be able to speak now. Do you see oftentimes how unbelief robs us of enjoying God's promises? God gave you a promise, but you're doubting, so you can't even enjoy God's promise. God gave you a promise and a word. You can't even enjoy it because of unbelief. He said, you're going to be mute. You, you won't be able to tell anyone because of your disobedience or because of your unbelief, because you didn't believe my words. It, it robs us of everything that God wants to do in our lives. And these things are going to be fulfilled in, in, in their proper time. The, the good news of the Messiah coming, these things will take place and you won't be able to speak until your son is born. So what happens in verse 21? And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he had lingered so long in the temple. What happened to Zacharias? He was in the temple, and they're waiting and waiting. So why is he taking so long? They're waiting for him because he would come out and bless them with the blessing of Numbers chapter 6. Many of us have heard of that blessing. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up your countenance and give you peace. That's what the priest would have come out and give them after he had prayed for them. Well, they're waiting. Why is he taking a long time? And he, when he came out, it tells us in verse 22, but when he had come out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he, he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. He maybe was giving them signs, and they thought, well, he had to have seen a vision because he's giving us signs. They realized by his gestures that he had seen something and he maybe gave them some signs and he came out to Elizabeth and I don't know what he's doing. 
But he's giving her a sign. Something's about to, he may be just giving her a sign of, you're going to be a baby. You're going to have a baby. And, and God told me, you be, and then me, good, you know? <laughs> I don't know what he was saying. But he communicated somehow that she was going to have a baby. And notice verse 23. So as soon as these days, this is now a favored priest from a faithful from a fearful to a faithless, and then a favored priest there in verse 23. As soon as the days of his servant were completed, that he departed to his own house. Think about this. He, he went home now. For nine months, he couldn't speak. Nine months waiting for the birth of John. Nine months, he couldn't talk to his wife. Some, some guys would think, well, that, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. <laughs> No, but he couldn't share of the good news that the Lord had given him through the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel had given him news. He couldn't even share it because of unbelief. Do you, you know that unbelief, that's what it does. It shuts our mouth. Unbelief will always shut your mouth, but belief, faith in God will open your mouth to praise God. If you trust God and what he said, it, it will open your mouth to trust him, to praise him. And notice what happens here as the Lord gets all the glory in his own timing. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and, they, and she hid herself five months saying. And now why did she hide herself? Did she hide herself because she was embarrassed? No. Well, was this a conception that was done uh, by the old Holy Spirit overshadowing her like Mary? No. This was through the natural process of sexual relations between her husband and herself, there was nothing shameful about this. But notice what she does. She goes and she hides herself to meditate on what God's doing in her life. Don't you love this? And there are times that God is doing something in our life, and you know like what we like to do? We, we like to go and tell every single person on what we're about to do, what God's about to do with us. You don't have to say a lot of things. There are times where you meditate between you and God. You keep those things to yourself. Let, get, get, let God get all the glory. And notice what she says. This is how she's giving God all the glory. She hides for five months. And notice what she's doing, saying. This is how we know that she's speaking and praying with God. Thus, the Lord has dealt with me. Notice how God has been dealing with me. He's so faithful. Notice how kind he's been with me. In the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. God has taken away my reproach. He has been so kind. He has been full of grace. He's answered my prayers. He's taking away my reproach. Why does God take away our reproach? Because he, God answers prayers and always keeps his promises. Did you know that God can take away your reproach today as well? The reproach, that sin, the guilt of sin, the condemnation of sin, of the devil, of the world, that says you're not good enough, that says that you're not right with God, well, here you see how Elizabeth remembers that God is faithful, that God keeps his promises. She hides herself and says, the Lord has dealt kindly with me. What is the lesson that we have to learn here as we come to a close in verse 25? That God is powerful. He's ready to respond if we ask and we seek and we knock. This is the gospel of, of prayer and praise. We must ask, seek, and and knock. I want to I'm going to close with one verse, Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, the Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. When God's going to do a new work, you know what he reminds you? There is nothing too hard for you. There's nothing too hard for God. And you know why God does that new work? He gives birth to that new work in our life so that we can do the same thing that John did, turn people to Jesus. Point people away from ourselves and point people to Jesus Christ. It's not us, it's him. Amen? Let's pray.